and all of right. the wonderful friends. Merva phone died on me, guys, so I had to use this phone. They put in in this election campaign, and they put in all the time to carry a message of hope and justice all over our constituency. And through me, I hope to. All right, so what? Two percent or so uh, than the nationalist parties, which are combined on about thirty-five percent. That has been lots of talk of the impact uh, of Northern Ireland and its place in the union, particularly given the structure of Boris Johnson's Brexit deal. I suspect that the results tonight will put further pressure and generate further questions. I've been filming a lot of this. Okay, uh, Sam, yes, plenty of talking points there. Uh, we are hearing the result is imminent in very north. Now, this was a seat that uh, Labour took from the Conservatives uh, at the last election. The Conservatives want it back and on current form and would have a pretty good chance of doing so. We'll uh, have a look at that as and when it declares. But uh, John Burke on that issue of the union. We heard Nicola Sturgeon saying, right, and, and can you clear this up for us? Because I keep putting it to, to, to SNP representatives, including the leader. Well, how do you do it? OK, so you're saying this is a clear message to Westminster. But if Westminster won't legislate, we will deal with that in a moment. Barry North is declaring. Okay. Uh, Alan Charlie, Green Party, 802. Daily James Barry, the Conservative Party candidate, 21,660. Chris, Chris James Richard, the Labour Party candidate, 21,555. Lloyd Johnson, Gareth David Lee, Liberal Democrat. Okay, they've taken it back uh, pretty much on trend there. Uh, the Conservatives, that counts as a game. Very narrow, though, very narrow indeed. Uh, James Daly there with uh, 21,660, and uh, James Frith for Labour just behind there. Look at that majority, just over 100, 105. The Brexit Party and the Lib Dems both losing their deposits in Barry North. I wonder if I can get back to John Burke on that issue that Sam Coates was, was touching on there, the union, in particular Scotland, where Nicola Sturgeon now says they have this loud clarion call for another independence referendum. How? How does it How does it happen if Boris Johnson will not legislate for it? Well, it remains to be seen. It's a juxtaposition of political advocacy by the Scottish National Party on the one hand against legislative power, the power of initiative, on the other. The position, as I understand it, is very straightforward in constitutional and legal terms. The power of initiative lies with the UK government. It is for the UK government to decide whether such a plebiscite, whether such a referendum, whether such a public poll can take place. Now, I suppose if the government refuses, which I confidently expect Boris Johnson's government will refuse to allow such a referendum. There's nothing to stop Scotland going ahead with a public vote of its own. And but it would be declaratory effect. or indicative. It wouldn't have any binding effect. So it seems to me that ultimately it comes down to a matter of politics, possibly of negotiation, but certainly of politics. And if the UK government, which has won the election by a thumping majority simply says we will not do this it will not at any rate for a very appreciable period happen that said if for a very very long time for many many years there is a push from scotland you know there may be a sense that politically such a request has to be acceded to at some stage but i don't think it's going to happen anytime soon i'm bound to say okay uh, listen we're waiting for a result in jewsbury labour seat paul the sheriff there uh, under attack from the conservatives yet again we'll uh, we'll bring that to you as and when it happens but ed conway is going to tell us the story of the night so far and how the conservatives have won this general election that's right, Deborah. let's have a look here of course the main objection for every political party is to get over the winning line, 326 seats, and to get into 10 Downing Street. Let's have a look at what's happened with this election. Look at the Conservative line. There it is, over the winning line. The Conservatives have passed that landmark, and now they are in government, comfortably in government there. And you can see Labour there on 200 seats. So above the 200 mark, some people thought they might not make it that far. Will they get more than they got in 1983, a lot of people still trying to work that out. Uh, but let's have a look at how those numbers translate into our results map, our representation 
of the UK. There, you can see the scoreboard on the left. Let's fly past that and have a look at the new political geography of this country and how does that look? All the way from the more yellow in Scotland through to the rest of England, where you can see a lot of blue, some Labour red still, a lot more blue than there was at the start of this evening. And we are getting now to the final stages where most of those constituencies uh, have been declared. You can see Wales actually really eating into, in, in Wales, the Tories really eating into traditional uh, Labour territory there. So some, real, some blue dots there in Wales. Um, and then we saw also, didn't we? I mean, look up at Scotland, look at that yellow, a sea of yellow, perhaps not as much as we saw uh, at the, the peak of uh, SNP power a few years ago, but nonetheless, uh, a lot more uh, really clear. Uh, it's a clear picture there, isn't it, in, in Scotland? But let's consider as well some of the big names who tonight and this morning we have seen potentially, uh, is it the end of their political career? Or is it certainly the end of their time as an MP. So starting with Joe Swinson, Lib Dem leader in East Dunbartonshire. She's not the only uh, big name to lose their seat tonight. Also, DUP deputy leader um, Nigel Dodds in Belfast North lost his seat there to Sinn Féin. And Dennis Skinner, who would have become father of the house, he's lost his seat in Bolsover. He had stood there, Turner, he'd stood there for almost 50 years. So it's a really kind of stunning reversal of fortune we've seen tonight. And who knows, maybe there's a few more twists and turns yet to come. Ed, thanks very much indeed. Let's go to uh, Plymouth. Plymouth, more of you to be precise. Johnny Mercer. Yes, uh, John Berger chimes in. Of course, every time he mentioned a constituency, uh, <laughs> he knows precisely where we're going. Uh, Johnny Mercer, good to talk to you. You've got John Berger here, of course, who knows your constituency and all the others inside out, as you know. Uh, your reflections on the evening, you've crossed the winning line and uh, going well past it. Yeah, look, I think it's been a successful evening for the uh, Conservative Party. I think the country really clearly wants to move on, get Brexit done and move on to all these other things. Um, it wasn't really a shock if you spent time out in the doors, um, if you read the media and spend a lot of time on Twitter, obviously tonight's a bit, bit of a shock. But um, for the rest of us, I think it was always coming. I think uh, the Labour Party have been peddling a load of nonsense for quite a long time and they've... Um, and they've been punished for it. But, uh, you know, we need to get on now and meet the challenges that people yeah. expect us to. Um, what are the key ones? With the majority what, Conservative what, government. That's what I'm looking forward to. What are, the, what are the key challenges? What do you want to see taken on head on immediately after the withdrawal agreement is passed? Brexit is done. OK, there's a lot of negotiating to do. Yeah, what so next, Brexit. then? Yeah, well, for me, uh, things like public services. 30% of my jobs down here are... Public service, uh, public sector jobs. Mr. Mercer, um, I, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. We're, we're going to come back to you, but Winchester is declaring a Steve Bryan there, who actually did lose the whip for a bit, uh, trying to get back in Winchester. Let's listen. George, Labour Party, 2,723. <laughs> Brian, Steve, the Conservative Party candidate. 28,430. Ferguson, Paula Wendy, Liberal Democrats, 27,445. Well, uh, one of the big Lib Dem targets there in Winchester, but Steve Bryan getting back in uh, 28,430 for him, down slightly on his last performance, but uh, not a good enough performance by the Lib Dem Democrats. Again, it was one of these Remain Alliance seats that the Green Party not standing there. Well, listen, let's uh, hear more from Johnny Mercer, who was kind enough to, to hang on there. And uh, your, your reflections on holding on to Winchester, Steve Bryan, your... Your colleague there back in, glad to see him, because I say he did lose the whip for a bit. Yeah, look, Steve's a good guy, and uh, he's a good One Nation, modern, compassionate, conservative um, like myself, and I'm, I'm pleased that he's come back. But we've got a job of work to do to get on with uh, the country now and to fix uh, a lot of the challenges that were talked about in this election, and we're very much looking forward to it. Yeah, One Nation, conservative, I mean, do you see the party still being that, or has it moved to the right? No, I think that's very clearly been answered by the British people during this 
uh, during this election. Elections are won by parties that are that try and go for the centre ground, that try and go for the one nation agenda. You know, fulfilling a referendum result is not extreme. It's uh, actually honouring the result of, the, of something the British people have voted for. So let's get that done and then move on to all the progressive, modern, compassionate, conservative stuff that I know Boris believes in and people like me are in politics for. But how do you re-establish that uh, connection with the public? And we, we all know, and it was part of the Conservative campaign, how disaffected they've got with all the politicians. Now, in a lot of those seats, Conservative MPs are replacing Labour MPs, some of whom were self-avowed socialists. How does the Conservative Party take that on board? Look, I think, uh, I think what you're getting at is fair. I think that a lot of people have put their faith in us now. Um, you know, who voted for us perhaps for the first time, that's a, that's a challenge. That's a real opportunity to go and redefine who votes for the Conservatives in 2019, 2020 and beyond. And for people like me who, uh, who think we're on a journey to uh, reaching out to more and more voters, I think that's, that's pretty exciting. I think, you know, Boris has clearly got this agenda. He's always had this agenda. This is why people like me supported him. Brexit has uh, sort of clogged up the machine. But, you know, once that is done, we can move on to some really exciting stuff. We've got to mm. uh, invest in the NHS and schools and all those good things that, uh, you know, the British public wants to see. And will it serve them if by the end of 2020, and Boris Johnson has pledged that there will be no extension to the transition period, if a trade deal is not done with the European Union, would it be serving these, these new Conservative electors if there were, in effect, a, a no-deal Brexit? I think um, everyone's kind of fed up with uh, the constant what ifs, what ifs. Boris is pretty clear he's going to get a trade deal by the end of next year. Let's let him get on with it. Let's get it done. Uh, and meanwhile, get on with all these other things we talked about in the election that people like me got into politics. Yeah, so, yeah, but you know, I mean, the thing is, sorry, they're cheering behind you. I wonder if you can still hear me. But you know, the thing is, is that it isn't done. It isn't done with the withdrawal agreement. There's an awful lot more to do. The, the heavy lifting is still to be done. Okay, uh, Johnny Mercer uh, there. Thank you very much. I think Dewsbury's declaring there, as I say, Paul the Sheriff trying to hold on to a pretty slim majority there for the Labour Party. She can can well, she go against the trend? 26,100. <laughs> Commonly known as Stanton Sir Archibald Earl yeah, yeah. Eaton, the official monster of the Radio Looney Party, 252. Yeah. Blackington John Edward, Liberal Democrat, 2,408. Sheriff Paul Amishar, Labour Party, 24,618. Yeah. Well, uh, as I said, that Paula Sheriff defending a pretty slim majority, certainly by uh, the standards of this evening, of about 3,321. That's been overturned again. It goes in the Conservative column. It goes under a Conservative gain. There's the result. Mark Eastwood uh, elected. Now, comfortable majority, 1,561. Paula Sheriff will not be sitting in the next House of Commons. It's just gone half past five and you are watching the brexit election right here on sky news let me take you through the headlines so far so many of them the conservative party has won the 2019 general election and secured a majority in the house of commons the prime minister who retained his seat says it's given a powerful mandate to get brexit done Jeremy Corbyn says he will not lead Labour into the next election after big losses for the Labour Party. And some very big names from all the parties have lost their seats over the course of the evening, including the leader of the Liberal Democrats, Joe Swinson, Dominic Grieve and Labour's Caroline Flint, amongst many others. But it has been a successful night as well for the SNP and its leader, Nicola Sturgeon, who was celebrating there after the Lib Dem leader, Joe Swinson, lost her seat to the Scottish National Party. OK, Brexit election, Conservatives have won. John Bocan talking to, to Johnny Mercer there, and it is... I mean, it's a recurring theme now. It's going to be discussed. Of course, the celebrations. 
But it's what we do now, really. We, we, we do Brexit, and they've termed it rather narrowly, get the withdrawal agreement passed. But then you've got a big majority, some big opportunities, and maybe some big problems, too. Well, there are going to be lots of big problems, because governing is an extremely taxing and challenging business. And there are all sorts of problems, some of which are intractable. I think the difficulty, really, with the Conservative manifesto was that it was thin almost to being threadbare. There was a number of very, very small, possibly valid, but very small ideas in it. But it was obviously designed to be a safety first approach and indeed to be a focused manifesto. Well, I've, I've done that for overridingly yeah. and overwhelmingly, almost to the exclusion of all else, on the delivery of Brexit. Now, that had the advantage that all the resource, all the intellectual resource, all the campaigning resource was focused on that one subject. But it did mean that there was a huge void. There was a blank page. And it, it seems to me that in manifesto terms, there is, dare I say, a third way to use Blairite terminology. You can have ridiculously loaded manifestos that have got far too many things in them, given that most people don't read them anyway. Or you can have a, a virtually blank canvas. And okay. it seems to me that the Tory manifesto was a virtually blank canvas. Now, the opportunity of that is that Boris Johnson can fill in the pages, and it's up to him and others to do so. And if we're going to get a flavour of what this well, is... Well, we're asking for, we're asking for the flavours, aren't they? Because, because, I mean, Beth Rigby, we're talking then pretty soon about to recast the cabinet. We had gone at yes. on, it seems, an age ago, held on to his seat quite easily in the end in Isha and Walton. Didn't seem sure if he's going to stay as foreign secretary. We Here's Santi Javid, really. But, so, but that personnel will tell us a lot, won't it? Yeah, look, it was it was interesting in the campaign. There was only one cabinet minister that Boris Johnson publicly said, I'm keeping them in the job, and that was Sajid Javid, the Chancellor. So Sajid Javid is nailed on, but everyone else he wouldn't comment on. And yes, he will get to pick his cabinet. Now, I have to say that given he only selected this cabinet in July, he's been he's only been prime minister for just over 100 days. I wouldn't expect a gigantic reshuffle at this point mm. in time but it was to i mean it was to send out a message get brexit done pretty but tell dominic rather in there on the on the hard side jacob rees mogg brought him brought him to government he doesn't necessarily have to keep them there does he he doesn't have to keep them there but he's going to get a very different party it's going to be a very different makeup in his parliamentary party now there's going to be a lot of new people uh, who have to learn the ropes and he's lot uh, he's lost a lot of big beasts as well so maybe uh, he will sort of sit and think about that i wouldn't expect a big dramatic uh reshuffle he doesn't need to be radical right at this moment he probably the focus will be for boris johnson not what his cabinet looks like it will be getting the withdrawal agreement bill and the queen's speech through the commons before christmas because he promised people that he would get uh, Brexit done, get the withdrawal agreement passed by the end of January, and he needs to get a reading through the Commons before Christmas, doesn't he, John? Yeah, okay, right. much, 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 much more on that coming up, but uh, let's bring you up to speed. It's 5.38, just turned in the morning, and the Conservatives have won the general election. And Sky News can now project the size of their majority. And this is it. The Sky News projection is that the majority will be between 78 and 82, the highest majority for any government since 2001, the Tony Blair years. We hope to hear from our election analyst, Professor Michael Frasher. He's been involved in that projection pretty soon, but uh, he's... Uh, well, he's getting a seat put in there. He'll be, he'll be with us very soon. Come on, Michael. You've got, got room for you. I know it's early in the morning and you've very, been up all night. Very informal. Have a seat. You've got your microphone on. <laughs> there you are. No formality now this time in the morning. Well, no, t tell us about that. I mean, the size of that majority. I said it, it, it's a Blairite majority. Yes, yeah, so let's and just, let's just remind ourselves of what we said at 10 o'clock with the exit poll. We said a majority of 86. And this projection, after all of these results, uh, takes us pretty near that. It's only two or three seats out for uh, the Conservatives. So I think that's a remarkable yeah. performance by the exit poll. How, how does it do it? How does it get it so accurately? I mean, you're in, you're involved in it. This is, well, 
two back to back and plenty more before that. Yeah, I mean, in truth, what happens is that you make a forecast on every constituency and then you add all those probabilities up and you come up with a number. And if you examine the detailed entrails of all the results, the exit poll has missed some uh, uh, or yeah. it's overshot some. And you kind of hope that the, the error more or less balances out, which it has done. Can I, can I ask you, I've been dying to ask this, how stressful is it? How stressful is it having to do the exit poll and then waiting all night to see if you're right or wrong? Do you get really stressed or uh, do well, you just... To be honest with you, the, the, it is so exciting waiting for that initial view of what the exit poll is telling you. And it, it told us it was uh, quite a sizable Conservative majority. But then as more Labour voters come out during the day, it, uh, the, the size of the Conservative majority you, you know, did reduce. And it reduced all the way through the day yeah. until we got to that 86 ah, okay. figure. But okay. you were expecting a majority. Well, you said to me a few days ago you were expecting a majority, didn't you? I, I, I knew that. I, I sort of thought, yes, there will be a Conservative majority. What I didn't, and therefore I was pitching it around about 40 or 50. But I also added that if Labour imploded, in some parts of the country, which well, it seen, did. You've seen well, all England, lines. Scotland, and parts of Wales. Yes, um, and, and therefore it was going to increase the, the Conservative majority. And um, in, in you know, so to, to get a, a majority like this, and we are the difference between a, a majority of seventy eight or eighty two is three seats. Yeah. So we're waiting for um, St Ives. Right. If if the Tories lose St Ives, obviously their majority goes down. Mm. If they lose Cheltenham to the Dems, oh, um, you know, so there are little Still stories for those going on there. But um, this is a easily a working majority for, for Johnson, and as you say, it's the largest majority since uh, Blair in you know, the 2001 election. So it's a, an amazing performance, really. And it's after four Conservative in administrations. Of course, some of them have been truncated for the reasons we all know about. But is is that unprecedented? To, to put on so many seats. Well, certainly in, 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 the, in the modern era, to add votes in the way that, you know, the Conservative vote share has increased uh, over these uh, elections. But I think it also reflects upon the poor performance of Labour as well. I mean, the, you know, the Conservatives look good because Labour performed so poorly. And, and the problem was all along that Labour was having to fight on two fronts. It was, it was trying to defend its seats yeah. in strong Remain areas, um, and it was trying to uh, defend those seats in strong leave areas. You just can't fight on two fronts. Uh, and, and they end up with an ambiguous position on the most important issue of the day in the Brexit mm. election. And, and they pay the price could, for that. You, could you say also that um, although Boris Johnson's taken the spoils uh, big time tonight, that Theresa May did a lot of the groundwork for him in 2017? Because oh. a lot of these seats... It was the same strategy, really, wasn't it? And a lot of these seats were swinging anyway to the Conservatives, but she just missed out. She like away. The she gave it the she, final heat. Yeah. In one sense, yes. In another sense, you know, what's been happening in these constituencies is that there's been demographic changes taking place. Mm -hmm. and, and we focused in, in, in our campaign coverage on what's been happening in many towns um, and contrast that with cities so that Labour has performed okay in the cities, but it's not performed very well uh, in the towns. Mm -hmm. And the Conservatives just marched into these areas and occupied uh, this ground. And it will take the Labour Party, I think, more than one election to recover from so John, John, I, mean, I, I want to bring in John Burker. John Burker, uh, it's, it's that time in the morning. Now, I know you've uh, observed many, many of the MPs up close and personal over the years in, in the House of Commons. And you're, you're quite good at giving us a um, uh, flavour of how this thing, how, how might we imagine Boris Johnson uh, addressing the, the troops after this tremendous victory? You'll get a hero's welcome. He knows that very large numbers of those new members have arrived in the House thanks to him. And very importantly, they know that they are arriving in the House of Commons very much thanks to him. So although, of course, it's customary for Conservative leaders and cabinet ministers, as Michael Gove did earlier in the proceedings, to say, well, we've got lots of wonderful candidates around the country, and all of that is no doubt true, and each party can say that. The truth is that the leadership matters. The framing of the narrative matters. The passion and energy of the communication matter. 
And those people who come into Love Storms the first time will feel an overriding sense of gratitude to the Prime Minister, and as good boys and good girls, and appreciative boys and appreciative girls, they'll want to support That's all in the line. And what about, um, you know, the course of the campaign? What about the, the oratory? You know, uh, you've had plenty of good speeches. You've made a few yourself. You make plenty yourself. How is Boris Johnson measured on that scale? I've never myself regarded Boris Johnson as an orator. He can be very witty. He can have a deft turn of phrase. He's got a certain aplomb and panache. I'm not sure that many people would call him an orator. But, you know, he has something about him. He is obviously an intriguing and for many people charismatic character. There were many criticisms that can be lobbed at him. But look, tonight, this morning, he has clearly won. He's won big. He deserves the attention of the country and the opportunity to put into practice his philosophy, his program, and his policies. And uh, Beth, I mean, how, how has he done? Eaton educated, you know, plenty of others in, in that cabinet, gone to these areas of the country where, you know, they wouldn't allow a tall look, dog in uh, often in, we, in the past. Yes, but how's it been done? Look, if you actually look at yeah, the ratings my of hand. Boris Johnson through the campaign, he's got less popular with yeah. the public, okay? So he's he started off with pretty good, and I, I, I've got them here. I don't know if I can find them in time. But he, he, got, he started off uh, with quite good favourability ratings, relatively, and he actually ticked downwards in the election, and actually Jeremy Corbyn managed to halve Boris Johnson's lead. So I just want to frame it in... Basically, it's not because the country really loved Boris Johnson that the Tories got this majority. As I was saying in the campaign, it almost became a race of which of these two people is the least repellent yes. to you, to be honest. Yeah, Brexit but, fatigue, but, the, but the messaging and the message discipline, and you've got to give it to that vote leave team yeah. uh, in number 10, the guys that and, and the girls that did the vote leave campaign in 2016 with take back control they uh re they regrouped they went into number 10 they were running a government but really they were running a campaign machine again and they came out with get brexit done and it was so powerful and if i say to you what was labor's Woo! strategy in the election can we carried away there guys was, uh, let's have a renegotiation <laughs> people that are watching three months and then we'll have another referendum and uh, i might or might not campaign <laughs> in favor of it you know, is that that you know, my, my point is you know when a party has got a good message we did a couple of focus groups and people were parroting back well i just think get brexit done yeah. and when people are unprompted yeah. running out your slogans yeah. labor's this time was time for change yeah. Uh, but it didn't cut through in the way that Get Brexit Done did. So it was just a very, very well executed Yeah, and the campaign. Tories didn't take risks. As you guys can see, that's why BB gun on there, the on the, the chair. Election, We're not here to talk about BB gun. Of the no do the uh, didn't Brexit. Take risks. They closed down the negatives and they resisted where they felt they could. And you mentioned any that. scrutiny. And it's a big thing to Boris Johnson as well. He did have impressive message, message discipline yeah. in all the press conferences, in all yeah. the interviews. He lines. kept that. It, it was he. It was that message on loop, and he did do that. He did do that. Well, uh, he did do it. Yes, I remember those head-to-head -head debates. Every answer was <laughs> well after we get Brexit. We were playing get yes. Brexit done yes, bingo. We, we event, uh, yes, Ed, Ed Conway is standing by because we want to examine a very important feature of this election campaign uh, do you remember all these all this talk about all the, the new registrations that had been taking place the millions of people that were apparently registering uh, and it was thought that so many of them were were young people and would vote to not get brexit done that they'd yeah. be they'd form another youth quake which youth actually quake. did it exactly. in 2017 the... did, did it happen any of it in 2019 yeah that was it and everyone talked about it in 2017 and said there is a youth quake and then actually when the british electoral survey looked at it they found maybe it wasn't really a youth quake and it's worth just looking uh, at what we, we know so far from the the data that we've got here before we do that though i want to show you just for me this is perhaps the best way of looking at the results that we've had so far because you get a sense of which where the gains are coming from for the Conservative Party uh, and where the losses are coming from for the Labour Party. So have a look at that top one there. There you have the Tories, 355 seats, 
And let's move across to the right, and you see 56 gains for the Tory price. You see that up there? Let's add on who those gains have come from. And then you can see 53 of those gains have come from the Labour Party, three uh, from the Lib Dems, and then none from the other parties. Then over on the other side, you can see the Tories have had 10 losses um, to a variety of parties. And now look at Labour. I mean, it's, in, it's stark, isn't it? One gain net from the Tory party, and just have a look at this over here, 59 losses. 59 losses and 53 of them. Labour, the 50, 59 losses. Perhaps some of the demographic reasons why that might well be, Brexit being a large part of it, it must be said. But let's look at another question, which is age and youth comparison, you know, just, just the proportion of people um, below the age of 45 within particular constituencies. And here we have two ends of the spectrum here. Norfolk North, one of the oldest uh, constituencies in the country, so the proportion of people under the age of 45, 29.1, so one of the oldest, and partly that was a Conservative game before, you know, worth pointing out. Conservative game for the Lib Liberal Democrats, Norman Lamb there, uh, former uh, MP there. And then here we have a Labour gain from the Conservative. That Labour gain for the Conservatives it's, is in Putney, where it's one of the younger constituencies. And if we take all of these constituencies across the UK, Norfolk North, around there, and plot them against how old people are, let's move those over here, you can see the different picture, the changing picture of Britain's political landscape. The older the area is, these are the older areas of the UK, the more blue they are. Look, the more blue they are. That's Norfolk North over there. The more blue they are, the younger they are, the more they go for Labour. You know, this is a real change in the landscape in the UK happening over the course of this election, Irma. The demographic divide, Ed, thank you very much indeed for that. Well, now, the Brexit election may nearly be over. Well, it is over. Formally, the Conservatives have won, but the reaction to it, of course, has barely begun. My colleague Gay Burley has a special edition of Gay Burley at Breakfast, live from Westminster in a few minutes' time. And Kay, what a night, what a morning. Indeed, so brilliant work, guys, during the night. You knocked the spots off the rest of them, both you, Beth, and the rest of the team. You've done an absolutely fantastic job. Uh, headlines of the night, a massive Tory win and the scalps of the leaders that they have claimed along the way. Nigel Dodds, of course, who is the Westminster leader of the DUP, he lost his seat. Joe Swinson, uh, the Lib Dem leader, she lost her seat. Richard Tice, the chairman of the Brexit party, he didn't even get a seat in Hartlepool. And Jeremy Corbyn, it's a moot point as to whether or not he has resigned, but certainly he's handed in his notice. And he said on after a period of reflection, he will no longer be leading the Labour Party. To reflect on that, talking points with Will Walden. Will Walden, you'll know he uh, was the former press man for Boris Johnson, managed to get him elected as mayor. Uh, Craig Oliver, um, he'll be here. He did the same for Cameron. Alistair Campbell, you'll know him. Uh, and Paula McKenzie, special uh, advisor formerly to Nick Clegg. Uh, all of that to come, and I've got a funky set as well here with uh, the Palace of Westminster just behind me. All of that to come in just a few moments' time. But for now, back to you. Okay, now, funky set there. Quite a few results still to come in as well, so uh, stay with Kay for all that. Now, uh, listen, uh, Boris Johnson, we've been talking about the, the triumph for the Prime Minister. We've uh, got some audio. We've heard him speaking to some of the workers at Conservative party headquarters a little bit earlier this morning. Let's listen in. It's a day that I, 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 I think many of us have dreamed of, a day when the Conservative Party genuinely speaks for every part of the country. From Workington to Woking. We have one in Hale, we're going to get this right. In Bishop, in Bishop Auckland, in <laughs> In seats, that, in seats that Conservatives have not won for a hundred years, or, or, or more, or more. Wrexham. He's done red car, blue car. He's won his twilled son, which I first contested 22 years ago, and was finally dragged by a vote of my own tennis well, and a bullion Boris Johnson there recorded at uh, Conservative Party headquarters uh, congratulating the staff and all the workers on a 
incredibly successful campaign. Got a couple of minutes, guys, in this studio before we hand over to Gabe Early to sum it all up. Bo, what do you take away from the extraordinary evening? Well, my first takeaway is there is a Prime Minister that took a big gamble. He could have gone down as the worst Prime Minister in recent history if he'd and what taken this gamble it? and shortest lived and lost. And he took the gamble and he won and he won big. And now he has got a five-year term with a proper majority to change this country in a way that he sees fit and legislate. He will get Brexit done. Uh, and that is an incredible achievement for Boris Johnson and his team. OK, John Burko, and thank you very much indeed for uh, being with us. That was particularly those constituencies during the course of this dramatic evening. What do you make? What, what do you take away from it all? It's an unalloyed triumph for Boris Johnson. It is... A total disaster for the Labour Party 